Hello, everyone, uh, and uh, good morning. Okay. Um, I looked at my uh, schedule from last term. I'm precisely one lecture behind. See how it goes. I'm going to speed a little bit up. I don't know how much I can speed up, but we'll see. OK, uh, if there is uh, no questions from last uh, lecture, let me get started with the new lecture. OK, OK. Um, OK, so uh, so far we've seen two um, OS concepts, uh, threads and um, addresses space. Now the third one is process. Um, again, my assumption is that you've, uh, you, you know the uh, processes just to refresh your mind. Uh, so you can have a process with only one thread. Usually we we say the the uh, the thread that runs first is the parent thread, uh, and then the the later threads that are created they're child uh, threads within a process. Now uh, a little bit about uh, sharing stuff uh, inside a process. So what do we have? Uh, in a process. So process is basically more than one thread and an address space. That's it. Uh, so all the threads will share the address space with each other. What does that mean? Well, that means that each thread has access to the code. It's shared. The data for that process is shared. All the files that the process that if one thread opens a file, all the th all the other threads have access to that file. Um, uh, sorry, we're here now. When it comes to the context, and by context, I'm talking about registers within the within the processor. Uh, that's something that um, that is not shared. So we keep. Uh, this is this is the only isolation we get. Basically, each thread has its own registers uh, and PC. And here the stack is put here because technically each one of them is going to have their own stack. Each thread will have its own stack, put stuff on its own stack. But this doesn't mean that the, that different threads have no access to each other's uh, stacks. They do because the stack is part of the uh, address space, if you remember. Now, all the threads share the address space, so all of them can see each other's thread. Technically, if you want to write a uh, clean code, you shouldn't be touching uh, other threads stack. So, okay, so, so let me see if I explained everything here. You have an address space and more than threads. Um, yeah, so each process has its own um, memory. All the threads share uh, the memory, file descriptors, uh, file system context. Now, when it comes to protection and isolation, usually operating systems do almost nothing to protect threads from each other. So one buggy thread can mess up with other buggy threads within the process. But what operating system does is that it isolates processes from each other. So one thread in one process should not be able to um, um, access data in another thread of another process. Now, the trade-off this gives us is that the threads within one process can communicate with each other pretty easily because there is not much um, involvement from the operating system. And then uh, communication between two processes, it becomes harder as you have operating system in between. Okay, so the um, 
the operating system uses uh, PCB, uh, which is process control block, to track processes. That's the concept that you have seen, hopefully, in EC3, EC252. I got a question I will answer after this, uh, this slide. Um, uh, yeah, I will talk about page tables usually for each process that is um, created. We create page tables. Page tables, uh, again, we will cover them. We're not going to touch on page tables uh, in the labs, but um, it's it's an important factor. We'll, we'll talk about it. Um, one of the ways that you can create new processes is by using something like fork, as you have seen in uh, in Unix systems, uh, Linux uh, in particular. What you can do is you have a parent process. Uh, you uh, you fork that parent process. You create a copy of that. Now you have two different processes. Both of them. Uh, share the same code uh, and, and they don't share the same code. Okay. Oh, my marker fell. They use the same code. They don't share it in memory. They have to have their own memories, right? Um, but that's the way we create different processes usually. Now for threads, we uh, what you have probably seen in EC252 is we use thread libraries um, to create new threads. Um, I, I would assume that you've, you you guys have seen uh, POSIX uh, threads, P threads in particular, that you could create new threads, uh, join, uh, yield, and all of that. Okay. Now, one thing is that copying a process to create a new process is really expensive, whereas creating new threads within one process is less expensive because you already have the, you, all those threads already share uh, the memory space. So you don't need to create a different address space again. You have the address space, you just create new stacks uh, and create TCBs, as we will see later on. So let me answer the question. So the diagram you're showing is when one program has multiple processes running, right? No, uh, not different programs running within uh, an OS. Um, let me publish this. Uh, no, not really. So here in the in this diagram, so both of these two diagrams are just one process. So this is a process with a single thread. This one is a process with three threads. So this is this is we're not talking about multiple programs, right? Now within one process, here I have only one thread. So this one thread has its own stack, has its own register, and has its own PC. Now if I have three threads within my process, all of them are going to share the code, data, and files. Each one of them is going to have its own registers, uh, PC included. And each one of them are going to have its own stack, or at least we're going to allocate a stack per thread. So each thread is going to have its own stack. They still can access each other's stack because stack is part of the uh, part of the address space, and all threads share address space. Hopefully that answered the question. Okay. Are all the parents' threads copied? to the child process during a fork? That's a very good question. So I should say I don't know. I will get back to you on that question. I don't know. My guess is no. Only, yeah, I, get, I have to get back to you. That was a good question. So I, I, I have to look into it. Now, it, this picture actually tells it all. This um, alligator, the mama alligator, is the process, and then you can have a lot of these little alligators as threats. Um, 
uh, yeah, so with threads, we kind of like that's where we get concurrency because the threads are going to, you know, do things uh, in parallel, and that's where we get concurrency. And then with the address space, we get the protection. So the operating system is going to protect one address space from another address space. Now threads, all of them share, all the threads within one process share that address space. So operating system is going to do less protection or nothing among those threads. So those threads within one process, they can probably mess up each other. Um, but two address spaces, they're, they're going to be isolated by the operating system. Okay. Um, so one question you might you might ask you, you might ask is we saw the uh, address space the virtual address space layout of a C program right uh, if you remember in the previous lecture a second now in that picture we had only one stack and one heap now what happens if you have multiple threads and each one of them is going to have its own stack. So what happens is that first of all, all of the threads are going to have the same heap, so we don't worry about heap. For a stack, we're going to do something like this picture. So the first thread that is running gets the stack on top, uh, and then as we create more stack, more threads, we allocate stacks. We have to now worry about how much allocation should we um, put aside for the stack of thread one? How much allocation should we put aside for a stack of thread two? And so on and so forth. Now, this is kind of non-issue when you're talking about user processes. The reason is virtual address space is almost infinite, especially in a 64-bit system, right? You have a lot of memory, so you could give them as much as you want, as, as, as long as you stay within the... Uh, within the range of your address space. So it's less of an issue. You can actually be generous in allocating uh, space for each stack. Because now you can see, right? If if I allocate less than needed, then this stack could grow and mess up this stack. Um, but this becomes really an issue when you're doing um, kernel programming. Because usually you want to keep your kernel image um, minimal. So you don't want to, um, you know, you usually want your image to exist in, like to persist uh, in memory. Um, and that limits your, uh, how much you can allocate. That's why usually like systems like Linux um, have a limit of eight kilobyte, uh, kilobytes per kernel thread stack. Okay, uh, okay, where are PC and registers stored on a stack? That's a good question. I will uh, answer that in details. So first of all, we don't need to store registers when our thread is running because they're they're they they're just changing every cycle or so. Every time you multiply something or add something, the registers are changing, right? So the registers, are physical registers in your processor and they're changing uh, as you're executing. But the moment that you want to context switch between your threads, you have to save your registers so that next time you come back, you, you know what the registers were. Now, where do you save that? There are different ways of doing it. You could save it in your TCB, which we will talk about, or you could just save it on, the, on top of the stack. Um, which stack again? Again, let, let's talk about that later. But there are different ways that you can do it. At, at this point, that's that's the answer to that question. So, where are PCN? Okay, I just answered this question. Very good questions. Now, what happens if uh, threads violate the the memory that is allocated? Let's say this stack grows and you know grows 
more than what the allocation is. Well, programs shouldn't do that. And this is something that the programmer should take care of. Uh, usually, um, operating system doesn't do anything when it comes to protecting threats from each other. Uh, so we're because the same programmer has written the same threads, we're putting the burden on making sure everything is fine to the programmer. Uh, but there are things that we can do and some operating systems do, like uh, how can we, for instance, catch uh, such um, violations? Can we ca at least catch if a thread um, has um, overflown uh, it's, a, it's a stack? And the answer is yes, we can. There are ways to do, the, to do that. One is, uh, I have in the slide is, we could actually put something predefined at uh, at the address right before stack two. And then every time we context switch, we check the content of that memory to see if it's still what it was. So if a stack one grows and overwrites that content, we know that, okay, something bad has happened. The other way to do it is to just make this memory address uh, read only. So if the thread wants to write in it, um, it would, you know, raise an exception uh, so that the operating system can catch it. Okay, so what do we mean by multi-programming? So now we're getting to the meat of this. So the operating system, as I said, uh, is going to give a, an address space to each process. When you're doing multi-programming, what that entails is that you, you have multiple address spaces at the same time living in your physical memory. Um, and, and you're basically um, running multiple programs. Every time each one of those programs are running, uh, they get their, uh, the value of their registers come from the memory that is allocated to them. And something to note is that each one of these now are uh, virtual address spaces, right? Uh, that that will be this mapping will be the subject of series of lectures to come. How do we bring the memory of one application and map it to, map it to our physical memory? And then if we don't have a space, we kick it out, uh, provide more space for other uh, other processes, and then eventually bring that memory back. And where do we store these mappings? So if there is a mapping. The operating system needs to know what has been mapped to what, and that's where the page tables come um, handy. Okay, so that's that. Now let's take it uh, further. It's not just uh, space sharing the physical memory that gives us multi-programming. It, we also need to time share the processor. You can have a multi-programmed uh, system with only one processor. And the way to achieve that is uh, operating system acting li like an illusionist and also operating system acting as a referee. The illusionist part of it is that each thread or each pro uh, process thinks that it has its own dedicated process uh, sorry, its own dedicated processor and it's running. It shouldn't notice that it, the process should not know. It should be transparent to the process that it's now being paused and we're context switching to another process, giving now CPU time to that process to run and then pausing it, going to the next process and keep doing this so that we provide the, an illusion that all of these process, processes are running at the same time. Whereas in reality, you only have one processor uh, and you're just time sharing. And, and he, he, so this, this is the illusionist uh, role that operating system uh, plays. The part about referee is that, okay, now that I'm time sharing, I have to make a decision who should be the next one. Uh, and if you get the CPU, how long are you gonna have the CPU uh, to run? So th this becomes the referee part that the operating system has to make decisions. This this becomes a scheduling um, part of the operating system, which again will be a subject of our discussions 
as we go. Do programs mean the same thing as processes in this context? So let's let's put it this way. This is a good question. Um, I think I had this slide that you had the programmer editing a file, let's say a program, uh, and then compiling it to an image. Now, I would call that image a program. Now, a process is an instant instantiation of that program. So if you feel it's like classes and objects. So if you are saying programs, you're talking about the code, that image that you have compiled. Now, we instantiate from that and create processes. So each process is an, is an instantiation of, um, of that program. Hopefully that answered the question. If not, ask again. OK, so another question popped up. If a CPU has multiple cores, without it, uh, oh, wouldn't it run all the processes, depending on the number, at the same time instead of sharing? Yes, that's a very good question. So if you have a system with multiple processors, um, you could actually be uh, running multiple programs, multiple processes at the same time. The, the, the thing about it is that we almost certainly in many uh, real world systems have orders of magnitude, more processes to run than processors. So we can do some space sharing, allocating different processes to different processors, but at the same time, each processor now gets to run multiple processes. That's where the time sharing comes. OK. Um, yeah, we talked about that. Uh, and then this switching part is, is essential because we want the whole thing, that whole time sharing to be um, uh, transparent to the process. The process shouldn't notice. Should, when you program, you don't worry that your process, your program, when it becomes a process, is going to be time shared. You never think about it. You think that, okay, I'm going to, my, my program is going to start running line by line, and I'm going get to get the result that I want. You never think about, oh, I'm going to be paused at this point, and somebody else is going to run, and then I'm going to come back. You don't care about those. You run your program, and then the, it's the job of the operating system to provide that uh, transparently, the time sharing. And for, for doing that, we really need to save the context of each process or each thread uh, that we're switching between. Uh, and that would be uh, what comes next uh, in the slides. How, how, how can we save it? Where can we save it? And so on and so forth. Yes, yeah, so, and then what causes the, these um, switches? Uh, so you could, a timer could go off saying that, okay, you've had enough, now it's somebody else's turn. A process could voluntarily yield uh, its time, saying that, okay, at this point I don't want the CPU, I want to wait for my child uh, processes uh, to finish or something like that. You've, you've done fork exec, uh, so you should know when a process yields its time. Um, it could also be that the process wants I.O. Uh, and uh, I.O. takes time, so we don't want to waste CPU time. If a process is waiting for I.O., we're going to put it aside, save its state, start running some other processes. Got a question. So do you allocate the time between the processes based on the amount of threads running on each process, i.e. a process running 20 threads, ta uh, 20 threads takes less time than a process running five, five threads? You're on the right track, um, uh, child, <laughs> if you're not offended. So yeah, this is such a good question. It's it's the subject of scheduling. So how do we schedule? How do we make those decisions? To just give you a short answer and postpone further discussions to later, uh, the way it works in Linux, at least, is that we don't actually want to give more time to a process that has more threads, for whatever reason. Uh, that's what Linux does. So what happens is uh, 
um, as you create more and more threads in your process, the weight uh, or the time each one of them gets decreases. So that in summation, your process is um, treated, uh, uh, you know, equally than any other process. So we want to be fair among processes. We don't want to be fair among threads. Now, I'm not saying that's the best decision or good decision, or it should be that way, right? Uh, but it's the decision that you, uh, I think it's the default decision in Linux. You probably can change it, but that's the default decision that that happens in Linux. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. That was a good comeback. Yeah. You're welcome. Good. Okay. Okay. Uh, great. I, this is one thing I actually love about lectures, and thank you for everyone who is who is attending. I really encourage if you you know you chat with your friends, definitely ask them to come in. Uh, the thing about live lectures is that you, as my audience, can dictate what's gonna happen next by your questions, by you know the hu I like the humor of it. I like if if you were not here, I would be just you know talking whatever I have in the slides and then release it. Um, and you probably wouldn't be asking these questions later on. So I really appreciate everybody who has come. And if you again talk to your friends, encourage them to come. So it gives them a schedule. It makes the lectures, you know, interactive. Um, it's fun for everyone. I, you're going to listen to the lectures anyways. So uh, one more thing. Don't feel like if you miss a lecture, don't feel like, oh, I'm I'm behind. I have to first listen to that lecture and then come uh, and attend the further lectures. It's fine. You can always go back and watch the lecture that you missed. Uh, what will happen as we will go, we're going to talk about different topics. There is a thread that connects all those topics to each other, and that's operating systems. But sometimes we're actually jumping from topics to topics. So if you missed something in scheduling, you don't probably need to first listen to that to understand what we're going to say about memory. Uh, and if you miss something in memory, you don't probably need it to understand what we're going to say about I.O. So even if you miss a lecture, attend the next lecture. It's fine. You don't really um, need to first listen to the lecture and then come back. Sorry for getting off track. So another question, would it be possible to give priority to certain programs so the CPU runs them for longer without switching? Yes. <clears throat> that's actually what happens. <clears throat> so uh, that's what I said weight, um, the weight that we assign to each thread. Uh, so some threads or some processes will have uh, higher priorities, and that will be something that you're going to do actually with your kernels uh, in the labs. We're going to define priorities, and then each thread is going to get uh, a priority assigned to it, depending on whatever you know, criteria you have. Let's say, you know, you have an interactive application like a, um, let's say you're, you're watching a video or it's you're playing a video game um, and responsiveness is something that you care a lot. So you actually give that application higher priority. You want that application to get uh, not necessarily more CPU time, but you want it to get the CPU when it actually needs it. OK, so uh, scheduling uh, is operating system deciding who gets CPU protection, operating system, um, isolating different processes from each other. That's all to, that is into it. Now, a little bit about scheduling. I think I talked about, about it quite quite a bit so I can probably move on faster but usually we make a scheduling decisions based on a criteria that is important to us it could be fairness we just want to be fair among different processes it could be um, that we have time constraints as we will have in our uh, real-time uh, operating system uh, it could be latency uh, related it could be a mixture of all of these which is usually the case. So you might care about a bunch of these 
all together. So you will design a scheduling policy that achieves most of them or all of them. Um, now, this is a this is something that people sometimes get confused about. What are we scheduling? Uh, in this slide, I'm saying okay, kernel schedule uh, kernel scheduler uh, maintains data structure containing PCBs. So that is true uh, to some extent, right? The let's let's assume that each uh, process has only one thread. Let's assume for now. In that case, process and thread are almost the same. So your your process has only one thread. So why to bother even talking about threads? In that case, operating system only cares about processes. So all we need to care about is process uh, uh, processor control blocks. So we we need to have data structures to um, maintain an order of all the process uh, processes that are ready to be executed and now we want to make a decision okay i'm going to run this process now let's now move on to a setting where process each process could have multiple threads in that case instead of the the operating system maintaining data structure to order process control blocks now i have multiple threads within a process so we introduce something called TCB, which is thread control block. Now, in that case, in that scenario, the operating system maintains the data structure to order TCBs because now the, the unit of execution is threads. So I'm going to decide I'm going to run this thread, then this thread, this, this thread, and so on and so forth. So the operating, this PCB changes to TCB when each process could have more than one uh, thread. And then th that's basically what the scheduler does. Either it be PCB or TCB, we have a, a data structure that maintains all the ready ones. Whichever, what do we mean by ready? It means that if I give it CPU, it can start executing. So if my thread is waiting for IO, so I have issued a request to read a file and the file is still not ready. So if I get CPU, I'm not going to be able to use it. So I'm not ready. So I'm not going to be in this ready processes list or ready threads list. So we're going to maintain a list of all the ready threads, those that would be able to use the CPU if we give them. And now we select that thread or we select that process. Um, as a next PCB or next TCB, and then we start running it. And if there is nothing, we just run idle process. We don't do anything. We will wait for a thread to come, which is probably what your, um, you know, your Apple Watch or your um, your cell phones are doing most of the time, because there is not much to do. They're idle. Okay, now ready queue. Uh, the ready queue is, as I mentioned, is basically just all the threads or processes that are ready will be in a queue. Now we're not talking about what exactly this queue is going to be. Is it going to be a linked list? Is it going to be a, a more advanced data structure? Probably. So one of the things that you will make will have to make a decision in lab two is what data structure you want to use to maintain this ready list, given that you're going to have priorities. So you're going to be sorting threads based on their priorities. So you have to make a decision. What data structure is good, gives you better you know, um, runtime in maintaining an ordered list. So in one example I can give you is in Linux, uh, the completely fair scheduler C, uh, CF, completely fair scheduler CFS uh, uses B, B plus three uh, to maintain this ordered um, um, list of ready threads. Now, 
is there only one ready queue in my system? Not really. So you definitely for each resource, you will have a ready queue, right? CPU is one resource. So you will have ready queue for, C for CPU. What that means is, well, um, everything in the ready queue of TC CPU, if you give them the CPU, they can use it. Now, if you have other resources like IO, like, um, um, you know, uh, your network card, your whatever you name it, they also could have their own uh, ready queues, all the threads that are waiting for that for that resource. Uh, so the one that we're going to put efforts into understanding and maintaining is going to be the ready queue for for the CPU. That's the most important one. But as I mentioned, for any other resources in your system, you could have a ready queue. You could maintain an order. Let's say many processes in your system, many threads want to send packets. Uh, they're using you know sockets or you know uh, different protocols. They all want to use your NIC, so you could maintain a ready queue of those. How? Which one do you choose to service first? Um, so, so whatever we're going to dis discuss is going to be applicable to those cases as well. Uh, the 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 concept is not going to change, right? Here is one example, right? Um, and again, so the reason I'm just sticking to PCB is is uh, an underlying assumption that for now I have that each process is going to have one thread. The moment you change that assumption, the moment you say, no, I'm going to have multiple threads in my process, just change this PCB to TCB. Now you have to maintain an order of your threads uh, rather than, piece, uh, rather than uh, processes, because that becomes the unit of a scheduling. You're scheduling threads, not processes. OK, so there is not much into this, right? You have different, um, different resources. Each one of them will have a queue of, um, of ready processes or tasks or threads. By the way, in, in our in our labs, we're going to call them tasks. Why? I would have called them threads, but usually in real time systems, they call threads tasks. So sorry. So there we have it, it's going to still be TCB because it's task control block. Uh, it's not thread control block, but they have almost similar. Uh, they're conceptually similar. So here is um, here is another thing that you can add uh, to to your understanding. You could have each PCB pointing to TCBs as well, and then have an order of PCBs. Again, how do you order them? Uh, what data structure you use? You want to give all these threads. So if I do this, as you're seeing, let's say this is the data structure I'm using for my uh, CPU ready queue, let's say. And let's say that this PCB is the head. What this exactly means is that I'm going to give all these TCBs higher uh, priority than all the other ones. That's what this struct data structure means. Now, I could do it differently. I could first do this TCB and then this points to this TCB and then this TCB points to this TCB and then this TCB points to this one, this one, this one. So that makes a different scheduling order. So this this th just is an example. Um, you could eliminate all these PCBs and just care about TCBs. You could have PCBs and then each PCB has TCBs. Decisions that you can make when you're designing your system. Oh, one thing to mention here, very important. I will answer the question once I'm done with this. Um, sorry. So one thing to mention, if I'm context switching between this TCB and this TCB, basically if two threads within one process. So what, what's going to happen? Each one of these have their own, has its own uh, registers that I have to load. So probably I have saved it somewhere, let's say in, in their TCBs or on the stack. So I have to bring it back. Now the moment I bring back the registers, 
for that thread, I can start running that thread, right? That's all it takes. Now, not that um, easy though. So if I'm going from this TCB to this TCB, after I context switch between um, the two threads, almost certainty, certainly um, I can start running that thread because it shares address space with the previous thread that was running. So when that previous thread was running, the memory content was in, in the physical memory. The address space was in physical memory. Now that I am running as a brother to that thread, I'm pretty sure that my uh, I can also go to the same, I share the same address space. So my address space is also in the memory. So I can start running pretty easily. Now let's assume that this, another uh, example, let's assume that I want to go from this TCB to this TCB. So let's assume that I have stored the registers in this on the stack. And the stack is part of the address space. Now, if this new thread, its address space is not in physical memory, let's say, let's say I have kicked it out, it's now in persistent, mem persistent storage, it's in hard disk. For the operating system to just bring that address space back to physical memory and then copy the registers uh, to the processor, that takes a lot of time. So context switching between threads within one process is much faster because everything is already in physical memory. I just switch the registers, I'm ready to go. Whereas Context switching between TCBs um, from different two processes may take a lot of time, depending on uh, the state of the other process that the, the other thread that is going to be executing. So that's the the last line here. If you're switching between threads across um, processes, buckle up. It could take a lot of time. If you're context switching between threads within one process, it could be really fast. Okay, uh, now the question, is it possible to do one hour lecture three times a week instead of one point half hour lecture two times? Ah, then, uh, I mean, it is possible, but uh, it would require a lot of uh, scheduling because now I have to find time that works for everyone and, and stuff. So at this point, probably not. Um, yeah, it's hard to find the time that works for everyone. Sorry. Okay. Next, uh, protection. Always use protection. This is my dad's side uh, kicking in. Um, always use protection. Be smart. In operating systems, obviously. Don't think in different contexts. Operating system has to provide protection um, between uh, address spaces. And why is that important? Reliability, security, privacy, fairness, all of that. Uh, it's quite understandable that if you don't um, isolate and protect different address spaces, they're going to be able to mess, mess up with each other. And you might say, oh, that's fine. Two processes messing uh, up with each other. But one thing that you have to consider is that kernel itself is one process, one big process. Um, and part of the protection is protecting the kernel address space from other processes address spaces. So if you don't have it, then then kernel is susceptible, susceptible to um, all the uh, failures that could happen. Okay, uh, so, and when we're talking about protection, we're talking about protecting memory, protecting processor, protecting IO devices, um, and all of that is, is basically included. One example, let's say you create, one process creates a file that uh, 
has only read only access um uh, I guess that that's not a good good example. Let's say, um, yeah. So one process wants to send packets over the NIC, um, and doesn't want anybody else to see those packets, right? We have to isolate those packets uh, so that other processes cannot access the content of those packets. For instance, okay. The other thing I, I think that the other thing that is mentioned here is is more fundamental. Uh, maybe we don't want to have we don't the operating system for whatever reason doesn't want to give access to a certain device to uh, access uh, to a certain device to a process. So this should be possible for operating system to block saying that okay you can't use uh, this device this particular device, um, and that's part of the part of the protection that the operating system has to provide. Um, when we focus on uh, protecting memory in particular, which is a very important task, the mechanism to do this is usually called um, address translation. That's the mechanism to provide protection and isolation. Um, and the way it works is that, OK, I know the virtual space of each process. Each process has its own virtual space. Now I'm going to have have mappings. Let's say I'm going to map this stack from this process to this range of physical addresses. And I'm going to map the heap of this process to this, uh, to this range of physical addresses. So operating system is doing this mapping. Operating system knows this mapping from virtual address of process X to physical address. This is actually very powerful. Why? Because whatever address that process one produces, I'm going to be assuming that it's produced in its own address space. Then I go to my mapping. I look at my mapping. I'm like, OK, this virtual address from this process is going to go to that physical address. So as long as I maintain this mapping, there is no way for this process to access physical memory that is mapped to another process. Because operating system is sitting in between, just redirecting everything that comes. So basically masking physical memory. When you're running uh, your, uh, your process, your process has no idea what range of physical memory is allocated to it. It only sees its own virtual address. And this is very powerful because how is it going to mess up the data of another process? To do so, it needs to know where the other process's data reside. Well, it doesn't even know where its own data resides because it has to go through that mapping, that indirection. And that's very powerful a tool to provide isolation. Again, a lot to come about that mapping, what that means, where it's stored, um, and a lot of things that are that it entails. We'll talk about them um, in quite a bit. Okay, now this example, do I want to talk about it? Maybe. Okay, so here I'm just putting together everything that we talked about so far. Um, this is just a figure to uh, put put everything into perspective. Let's say this is the code I have. This is uh, my instructions. This is the code. Um, and let's say th these are the CPU states, basically my registers. This is my IO state, all the files I have opened, all the sockets I have, and, and everything about IO. And let's say this is my memory allocation or my um, address space. So this becomes the sequential stream of instructions that I'm going to run. Um, these are the resources I'm going to be having. Processor is also a resource, uh, but then um, in particular, this is what it means uh, when we talk about context uh, of, uh, of my process running on the processor, basically the registers 
that the operating system has to store. So here is, uh, got a question. Do processes create their own addresses for their stack? When a process calls malloc, the OS gives the process a physical address. So where do the virtual address come from? OK, so this is a good question. First of all, let's first question. Do processes create their own address for their stack? It's usually done by uh, system libraries. So when you create a process, libc, for instance, creates a stack for you. And system processes are usually written by operating systems, right? Or provided by operating systems. So that first allocation of a stack comes from system libraries usually. Uh, in um, yeah, so in in our labs in lab two, we'll see we're gonna actually give this task to the operating system. So operating system, because we don't want to have system libraries, operating system is going to allocate stack. Um, basically, the operating system is going to allocate everything to processes in our labs. Now, that was the first question. The second question you have is, when a process calls uh, malloc, the OS gives the process a physical address. No. So what happens is the operating system assigns or um, uh, allocate something in virtual address to the process. So everything that process sees is virtual. But then the operating system at the same time is also doing the mapping from virtual to physical. So the process, the address that you're going to get is a virtual address. Um, and then you start using that virtual address. Every time you're accessing it, you're going to go through the kernel or a data structure that is put by a kernel called page tables to get it translated to physical address. Hopefully that answered the question. What is the difference between the physical address map mapping and the virtual address space? So I hopefully at this point you know virtual address. That's what the process sees, right? Um, the the example we had in that slide that we I showed you where everything goes, your stack, your heap. That's your virtual address. That's all the process sees. Now you also have a physical address space. That would be your physical memory. In general purpose operating systems, the application doesn't see physical memory. So that's where the mapping happens. So applications issue their virtual addresses, and then we're going to translate that to physical address and then get, get access to that data that resides in the memory. Now, that all being said, in real-time systems, and in particular in the in the one that you're you are implementing in your labs, um, we are just using physical memories, so physical address space. So there is no virtual address space, or virtual address space equals physical address space. That's the best way to put it. So there is no there is a one-to-one -one mapping in our lab, and one of the um, reasons for that usually with real-time systems. This translation going from virtual address to physical address takes time, and that's not something that you can afford in embedded systems and real-time systems. So usually, not always, there are real-time systems with virtual to physical address translation, but most of the uh, uh, real-time operating systems allow the processes or tasks or whatever to access um, physical memory. And one of the reasons for that is when you're designing a general purpose operating system like Linux, you don't want to make any assumptions about your users. You could have malicious users, you could have well-behaved users, you could have uh, all sorts of you know uh, experienced programmers who debug their code. Uh, 
uh, those who don't debug and there might be faults. So you don't want to make any assumptions. You want to take the safe route. When you're designing embedded systems and real-time systems, you usually actually have experienced programmers coding specifically for that. Like let's say you're designing a, you know, an operating system for a self-driving car. So you have set of engineers designing. It's not a general purpose. You're not going to put your operating systems on the market and then people are not going to run their random processes. You have well-defined processes that are going to run on your well-defined system. That's one of the reasons that you probably don't need isolation uh, to start with. So you just have one-to-one -one mapping from your virtual address to physical address. Is one of the reasons why we have virtual address and physical address not to expose physical memory address to the applications? Yes, we don't want to expose it because if they know, uh, if they have access to it, they can see or read or write um, uh, to and from each other's memory. Okay. Um, I actually want to jump from these. Um, so this, this, Figure shows multi-programming. Um, you have a bunch of processes, only one process, one processor, and the operating system is basically doing, um, making decisions who's gonna, it's just time sharing. Uh, uh, yeah, so switching overhead, you have a lot of overhead when you want to switch memory, probably, because there is a there is a possibility that you, that you have to bring memory from from hard disk. And that is a lot. So switching overhead is high. Uh, you have protection, right? Because in this case, um, you have, in I think in this particular example, you have one thread per process, and then you have isolation between processes. So you have protection. Oh, there was a problem, seems like. Yeah, anyways, so hopefully all of this makes, makes sense. Now, if you want, processes to share, uh, the overhead is going to be high because the operating system pro probably have to allocate some space somewhere and then one process writes to it and then the other process reads from it. So everything, every time you want to have communication between processes, you have to go through the operating system and that is expensive. What time is it? Oh, okay, time flies. Now, this is another example. Let's go back. So in this example, I have two threads per process. Now, thing, things improve a little bit. Uh, if So the switching overhead is medium because sometimes you're switching between threads within one process and sometimes you're switching between threads over multi, uh, across processes. So on average, the switching overhead is lower. So we, we say medium. Um, sharing overhead is also lower because threads actually share the same address space uh, in one process. Now let's assume that you have multiple CPUs. You add uh, CPU, more CPU cores here. Then switching overhead is really low because potentially, potentially you could be running your all of your threads on CPUs concurrently without even needing to context switch. So because the number of context switches go down, so does the switching overhead because it's amortized over more uh, work to be done, right? Um, now, okay, so hyper-threading is the next topic. Let's see if I have a question. So please feel free to take an extra lecture if needed. Um, thank you. Uh, I might or I may not. I could just drop one topic at the end. We'll see what happens. Okay. Ooh, um, and I don't have tea, unfortunately, today. Um, and I haven't given you a break. Let's have two minutes of break. I, I go upstairs, get some water at least, um, and then we'll be back. So two minutes of break, get up, stretch, uh, and we'll be back. <laughs> 
Okay, sorry for, huh? why sorry? That was a good break for everyone. Now let's talk about hyperthreading. Um, so if you remember uh, in the previous lecture, I had this slide um, talking about um, modern processors. And then we had physical cores and then threads, virtual, they call them threads. So if like today, if you go and want to buy a multiprocessor, they say, oh, it has four thread, four cores, four physical cores, and then eight virtual cores or eight threads. So that's the subject of this slide. I want to explain what that exactly means. To do so, let's look at the, the history behind it. So um, actually, there should be something bet between this super scalar architecture. So in, a, in the first processors that we had, we would, I think I had that slide where you fetch an instruction, uh, then you decode the instruction, then you execute the instruction, and then you probably save this, the result, right? Uh, now, the thing about that pipeline um, kind of like a steps is that some of those steps might take more than one cycle, right? So let's say I got a question. I will answer that question after after I'm done with this uh, this slide. Sorry. So let's say I'm, I want to save something in the memory. Um, you know that memory is actually a slower than processor, and it actually takes time, real time, for your data to go to memory and be saved. So as a result of that, you might be just waiting multiple cycles for that save to happen. So that explains all these um, white or empty blocks. So each one of these, so um, in this figure, now I let's let's assume that instead of just decoding one instruction or fetching one instruction, I can fetch multiple instructions at the same time. So let's say my processor has three lanes, meaning that I can fetch three instructions at the same time. Now, what happens is that I'm, I'm fetching some instructions, but then there are empty spaces here and there. And the reason is some instructions take more time to complete than other instructions. So let's say on this lane, if I'm looking um, uh, vertically here, I have time. And then horizontally, I have number of lanes that I have in my processor. And then every time I'm executing one instruction, it may take some time for me to get ready to, to execute the next instruction. So all these empty spots here, they're just wasted cycles. So it was a cycle that I had to wait for the previous instruction to complete. Now, in a multiprocessor, now I have two processors. And each, let's say each one of them is a superscalar. So each one of them has three lanes or four lanes or whatever lanes, meaning that they can execute that many instructions at the same time. So this would be the figure. I still have these empty spots. I just added another processor, so I'm faster in the sense that I, I have two cores now I can use. But I, generally speaking, haven't touched anything with regard to um, to these uh, the utilization of each one of them. One way to sort of fix this is to do fine-grained multi-threading. What that what does that mean? Well, it means that I can fetch instruction in this cycle. I fetch instruction from thread one, and then next cycle, I where I'm waiting for this for the fetched already fetched instructions to execute, I fetch instruction from thread two. Hopefully these are two different threads, they're independent. So these um, green uh, executions or instructions don't depend on these uh, uh, you know, yellow ones, so I can actually execute them uh, independently. And that potentially saves me some, some utilization. 
So I have decreased the number of these free spots. But I still have these free spots because um, I might not be able to actually fetch three instructions at the same time. Maybe I don't have that many instructions right, to fetch at that time. They depend on each other. So uh, let's say I have an add and then I have a multiplication and then I have a store of the result of the add and multiplication. Now, if I were to fetch three instructions at the same time, I cannot fetch the save instruction and execute save before finishing add and multiplication. So that dependency means that I cannot execute, even, even though I have the lane empty for me to execute the save, I still cannot. I have to wait for the add and multiplication to happen before I can fetch the multiplication. That's the save instruction. Now to solve that, what we do is called simultaneous multi-threading. And that's a capability that we add to our processors to be able to fetch from different two different threads at the same cycle. So in this one, in each cycle, I'm switching between uh, threads. Here in this one, same cycle, I can fetch from two threads uh, that I have. Now, as you can see, that actually increases uh, uh, increases my utilization and decreases uh, the number of free spots that I have. Now, that's pretty much conceptually what happens. Now, in reality, things are not that rosy because of two or three important things. First of all, now I have utilized my CPU, but I've also created contention, right? So it could be that at the same cycle, I can, um, now I have, let's say, three lanes. I might be able to fetch three instructions from, from thread one and three instructions from thread two. Now I have to make a decision. Uh, one instruction from thread one and two instructions from thread two, or two instructions from thread one and one instruction from thread one. So now I have contention. Uh, between these two threads because I have limited resources and they're actually competing with each other to use those resources. So that's the first thing to note. The second thing to note is that I have to actually preserve the context of these running threads that are running at the same time. What does that mean? That means that my core, if I have a hyper-threaded core, so I have one physical core, but it has two threads, what does that mean? It means that it has to have two sets of registers because at the same time, it's running two different threads. So it has to have two PCs, each PC is pointing to the instruction for each one of those threads, two sets of registers. So I have to copy all my registers. Um, so, so that's another thing. Uh, so overhead in terms of architecture and processor design. Um, so in particular, when it, you know, it boils down to what kind of uh, application you're running, if multi, uh, if hyper-threading is useful or not. Um, um, if you are interested in knowing more about this, I'm not going to deep dive, uh, sorry, dive deeper than this, <laughs> deep dive, uh, dive deeper than this. So if you are interested, there are actually very useful resources to, to look into. Um, with this uh, with this regard. From operating systems point of view though, all operating system cares is those registers. So if you have one physical core that has two sets of registers, operating system looks at it and says, oh, I have two cores because I have two sets of registers. So that's why when you're within your system and you look at number of cores that you have, from your operating system's point of view, these are all cores. Although I have to say, many scheduling policies distinguish between the fact that these I have actual physical cores that are independent, so there is no contention, or I have virtual cores that have some contention. So running your thread on a running two threads on two physical cores gives you a different performance than running them on two virtual cores because of that contention. Okay, got a question. Two questions actually. Um, first one, 
if a process writes to a file, is that file only in that process memory space? Is there a context switch involved in reading from that file in another process? So that's a good question. Now, it will depend. Um, when you're writing to a file, sometimes you can use mmap, memory map, to map the file to your memory. That reduces the overhead of reading and writing to file. So instead of calling system calls to write or read from the file, you can just issue loads and stores in your own process. Now, if another process also memory maps the same file, usually what operating system does is that it recognizes that this file has already been um, memory mapped. So it doesn't copy the file twice in physical memory. It, it has the file in the memory. It maps two different virtual addresses to the same physical uh, address. So in a sense, each one of those processes get a different range of virtual address assigned to them to, to work with that file, but they're writing to the same physical um, uh, physical addresses. And that's one of the most effective ways of communication between two processes. They can memory map the same file and communicate through that. So the same physical address, two different virtual addresses, and you have sharing. If you don't do memory mapping and you go through system calls like write to a file, then when somebody issues a write, it's going to go to a buffer to eventually be written to the file. And if somebody else issues a read, usually, usually what happens is that it, this read goes and first looks at that buffer and says, oh, the content of this file is going to change, so I'm going to return to you uh, the latest update. Or if there is none, it just goes to the to the disk and reads from disk and brings you the data back. So I hope I answered that question. So um, now in terms of is there a context switch involved? Not really, right? So there is a context switch if, let's say, you you have two processes and one core and one of these processes is going to write to memo to a file and the other process is going to read, then yes, you have context switch between these two processes. So you first run this process, it writes, and then you context switch, this process reads. So that there's a context switch between the processes. But if you have, let's say, two cores and each one of them are running on their own dedicated core, there is no context switching, right? Okay, for simultaneous multi-threading, are the threads each running on a different core or on the same core? So uh, they're running on the same core. Uh, what that means is each core has different resources, right? Like ALU, if you remember in the slide that I had. Uh, like each core has a certain amount of uh, computing power, like multiplications or summations or you name it, right? So those two threads, virtual threads, share all the computing power. So multi-threading would be really helpful if each one of these threads want to use a separate resource. Let's say one of them wants to use flo floating point units and the other one wants to use integer units. So they can actually run smoothly because they, there's no contention. But let's say both of them want to do floating point arithmetic, then they're going to share the floating point unit on that process. The only thing that they don't share is the set of registers. So each one of them has its own share of, uh, share of registers. OK. So now that actually reduces a lot of overhead, right? So context switching is really low. Um, um, uh, but then contention is high because now you're you're having contention on your uh, floating point units, your uh, your ALUs, and and so on and so forth. Now the last, um, I guess I have three more minutes. Uh, the last concept that we'll talk about about operating system, one of the most important ones, is dual mode operation. Um, 
So we want to distinguish between a user process and a kernel. So kernel process can do everything it wants, can have access to everything it wants. And user process has to be protected, has to uh, run in a protected way. So we're going to, a system usually has at least two modes, kernel mode and user mode. Um, kernel mode is supervisor mode, protected mode, and then user mode is the, is the normal program. I got a question I will answer. Um, how can hardware support dual mode operations? So this is one of the things that we're going to uh, we're going to rely on hardware support. That doesn't mean that we cannot do it by ourselves. We can, but usually hardware provides this. There is like the easiest way if you want to have two modes is to have one bit and then you switch that one bit. So if that one bit, let's say it's set, that means that you're whatever code that is running has privilege. Uh, to do whatever it wants to do. And if that mode is zero, it's not set, then that thread that is running cannot do certain things, right? What do we mean by certain things that are, one example is that mapping that I talked about from virtual address to physical address, that is done by operating system. So if, if we let a user process to change that mapping or have access to that mapping, then what's the point of having that mapping? We just want to hide that mapping, not only the content of it, but also changing it. So any instruction that wants to change that mapping should not be allowed if we are running in a user mode. Um, so that's one example, for instance. Uh, making a scheduling decision is another example. We want kernel to do that. Uh, let's say disabling intro. If we allow a user process to disable interrupts and we only have one core, then that user process can disable interrupt and do a while loop. So there is no way now for the operating system to come in and say, okay, you're done, somebody else's turn, because interrupts could not be fired, right? So there are certain things that we don't want the user program to do. That's where the uh, dual mode execution comes in. Um, uh, and then that's where we are getting some support from hardware uh, in a most basic sense, having just a one bit that identifies if we are in a user mode or if we are in a in kernel mode. Let me answer the question and end the lecture. I don't get the difference between fine-grained multi-threading and simultaneous multi-threading on the previous slide. Could you please explain? So with the with uh, fine grain, um, what we're doing is each cycle, at each time, we are only issuing or fetching from one of the threads. So if, you, if I go back here, so if you look at this figure, right, is my mouse? Yep, so cycle one, so time one, I'm only fetching instructions from thread one, cycle two, I fetch instruction from thread two, cycle three, thread one, you name it. Whereas in simultaneous multi-threading, I'm fetching instruction every cycle from both of them. Uh, so that's that's what it means. So in fine grain multi-threading, there is no contention between threads because you're just between two threads because each cycle you're executing a different thread, whereas in simultaneous multi-threading, you have contention. So they're con they're competing for the resources because you're fetching them at the same time. Okay, so that's pretty much what I have. I mean, I have a lot more, but uh, that's pretty much um, what time allows me to have. Let me see how many more slides do I have. Oof. Yeah, a lot more to talk about. Um, so I think I have to, again, push um push the schedule down anyways um it was fun so take care be safe we'll talk to you uh, again on uh on thursday bye bye